Praise the Lord. You know the last words of Jesus on that cross was, It is finished. No more work to be done. He won the victory over sin and death, was triumphant over sin, death, and the works of the enemy. And in him, we are victorious. Amen? None can pluck us from his hand. So praise God for that knowledge. (laughs) Turn with me, if we will, to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. So glad we sang about Jesus this morning and his victory Sealing all things with his blood. Because today we're looking at the eighth and final covenant that God made with man. And that is the new covenant. The covenant that we now know is sealed with the blood of the Lamb, Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. You can say amen if you like. Hallelujah. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. We'll read to verse 34. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbour, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. They shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads and commit this word to the Lord God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are speaking to us still today through your word. We thank you for these covenants that you have made and that you keep. We thank you for this final covenant, Lord. And I just pray that by your Holy Spirit you would open our ears, open our eyes and open our understanding to learn of you and grow in you, to be firmly established in the truth. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Praise God. So we've come to the last of our series of eight covenants which God made with man. Now, I personally think this final one, this eighth uh, covenant, the new covenant, as it's called, is possibly the most important, especially for us, because you're living members of that covenant. You're a living part of that covenant. Uh, but however, it's, it's a covenant that has led to so many false doctrines within the church. And I'll explain more about that as we go through this last study in our series. First of all, we're going to look at the participants. As we have done, we're going to follow the same format as we have done all the other covenants. We're going to look firstly at the participants of this covenant. This covenant was made between God and Israel. That is plain, isn't it, from the wording itself. Behold, verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Both houses, one nation. Israel. So I hope you can see and accept the pattern here. That from the Abrahamic covenant, God separated 
separated out for himself a people to be known as Israel. He separated out that people from every other nation on the face of the earth. And they were to be different from every other nation on the face of the earth. And as a consequence, all the following covenants from Abraham onwards to this final new covenant were made solely between God and his covenant people, Israel. And this is an important point to see and to accept and to understand. There are several scriptures that I'm going to list out here which give us confirmation of this fact. I'm not going to read them all. We'll read two. But I'm just going to uh, give you the scripture references so that you can note them down if you wish for further reference. The first one is Isaiah 55 verse 3. Isaiah 55 verse 3. The next one is again in Isaiah. It's Isaiah 59 verse 21. Again in Isaiah, Isaiah 61, verse 8 and 9. Now we pass into Jeremiah again. It's Jeremiah 32, verse 40. Passing into Ezekiel now. And Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 60. Again in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 34, verse 25 to 31. And finally, in Ezekiel 37, chapter 37, verses 26 to 28. And our final scripture for confirmation is Romans 11. I'm sure you'll all be conversing with that one. It's verse 26 and 27. We're going to read two of those. We're going to read Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 60. I'm going to read all of these because we don't have time, but Ezekiel 16. Verse 60. I'll start at verse 59. Ezekiel 16, verse 59. For thus saith the Lord God, I will even deal with thee as thou hast done which has despised the oath in breaking the covenant. Nevertheless, verse 60, I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth, and I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. God speaking there to Israel. And the final one is Romans that we're going to read out today. Romans 11. How many people know this, these verses by heart? I'm sure most of you do. Romans 11, verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, they shall come out of Sion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Covenant is for Israel. So they're the participants, God and the nation and people of Israel. Next we're going to look at the provisions of the covenant. Now, I read out to you quite a few scripture verses, quite a few scripture references rather, and we read two of them. But if you read all of those references and look at them carefully, you will find yourselves nine different provisions that are part of this new covenant and we're going to look I'm going to read out some of these facts of these nine provisions that we can find contained in all those scripture references that I gave you you can check them up for yourselves afterwards don't take my word for it and first of all we find that it is an unconditional covenant an unconditional covenant Covenant. God said, I am going to do this. Doesn't matter what man does, I am going to do this. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant 
with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And this means the whole of Israel as well. I want you to understand, this is an important point, the whole of Israel. And it includes, it did then and it does now, it includes what some people would consider the lost tribes of Israel. Let me tell you now, no tribe is lost. God knows exactly where they are and who they are. Even though all the genealogical background was lost when the uh, temple was burnt down in 70 AD, God knows. And these people are still represented. These tribes are still represented amongst the people of Israel. How do I know this? Well, they were certainly there in Hezekiah's day because he wrote to them all. And this was after the Assyrian exile of the ten northern tribes. Let's read Second Chronicles, chapter 30, verses 1 to 27. First Chronicles, chapter 30. Sorry, Second Chronicles. Did I say First Chronicles? Yeah, I'm sure you found out that there weren't 30 chapters in First Chronicles. Second Chronicles. My apologies. Chapter 30, and we're going to read from verse 1 through to verse 27. Yes, it's a long scripture portion. But it's important for us to understand what I've just said. Hezekiah, speaking just a short period of time before the Babylonian captivity, but after the Assyrian captivity of the northern ten tribes. And Hezekiah, verse 1, Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, remember, all Israel and Judah, and wrote letters unto Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. Neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they established a decree to make a proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan. In other words, from the southernmost part of Israel to the northernmost part of the nation of Israel. Dan was in the north, Beersheba in the south. The day should come and to keep the Passover of the Lord, God of Israel, at Jerusalem. For they had not come, they had not done it, sorry, of a long time in such sort as it was written. So the posts went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah, and according to the commandment of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hands of the king of Assyria. And be not like your fathers and like your brethren, which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as you see. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. And serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. So the posts passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, diverse of Asher, And Manasseh and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was to give them 
one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month, a very great congregation. I'm not going to read on any further, but you get the idea, I'm sure. Many, if not all, of those tribes in the north were represented and were written to by Hezekiah as being extant in the land. A remnant returned from captivity. They were there. They weren't lost. They were still in Israel. And so we see that this unconditional covenant is with the whole nation of Israel. Do we get that? We understand that. No lost tribes. Verse 5, specifically, you'll see that they were all represented in the land prior to the Babylonian captivity. Now, this is not for the church. It's for Israel. Israel has not been replaced by the church. The church is not Israel. God made this covenant with Israel. But as we'll see later, it does affect the church. Number two, that's the first point, by the way, of nine. Number two, this covenant is completely different from the Mosaic covenant. And in fact, it replaces it, it supersedes it. We see that from Jeremiah 31 verse 32. I've lost my place now. Let's get back. There we go. Verse 32. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. It was to be a different covenant, superseding that covenant that was conditional on the obedience of Israel. This covenant is unconditional. Now number three, this covenant contains the promise that Israel will be regenerated. Hallelujah. This covenant contains the promise that Israel will be regenerated. In other words, they will know salvation. Hallelujah. Amen. We see that in Jeremiah 31, verse 34, the first part. Sorry, 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. In other words, he was going to give them a new heart. A new spirit. This would be a recreation. A regeneration. And you sitting here in this room and listening to this word who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ will know what that means. A new life in Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. You can also find that in Isaiah 59 verse 21. One of the scriptures that... Um, references I gave you earlier. Now, because of this, oh, sorry, Isaiah 59, 21, yeah, sorry. The fourth one, fourth point, fourth provision of this covenant, this regeneration of the Jews, or the nation of Israel, would be for all Jews. Verse 30, um, Jeremiah 31, verse 34a. I'm going to read that because I want to bring something out of this point. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. They shall all know me. What did Jesus say everlasting life was? To know the Father. This is eternal life, that they shall know the Father. And that's what 
is speaking of here. And you'll find a confirmation of that in Isaiah 61 verse 9. One, again, one of the scripture references I gave you. Now from this, we can find that in the messianic kingdom, the time that this covenant is speaking about, the time where the Jews will be regenerated and all Israel shall be saved, as Paul states in Romans 11, there will be no unsaved Jews. There will be no unsaved Jews. Hence the statement in verse 34. They shall teach no more every man his neighbour and every man his brother saying know the Lord because they'll all know me. They will all be regenerated. That's the promise in this covenant to the Jews. Isn't that amazing? And of course, our brother and our uh, apostle of the Gentiles, Paul, confirms that for us in Romans 11. All Israel shall be saved. What a promise. I long for that day. Do you long for that day? When they'll, their eyes will be opened and they will see him whom they have pierced and they will cry out, Messiah. Hallelujah. Provision number five. In this covenant, there is forgiveness of sin. Why is that important? Because in the Mosaic covenant, there was a temporary covering of sin, not forgiveness. A temporary covering that came between the law in the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat above. The blood was a temporary covering so that God would not see the law and destroy Israel. But in this covenant there is forgiveness of sin, not just a temporary covering, which of course it was in the Mosaic. It's the removal of sin. Verse 34b second part of verse 34 they'll all know me says the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more now I remember a saying from someone I think it was our first pastor we did not long got saved and talking about how God deals with sin for the believer and he said it's God takes your sin your wickedness your perversion and your filthiness And he casts it in a sea of forgetfulness. And he posts a sign, no fishing. No fishing. If he's forgotten it, why should you remember it? Amen? Praise God. So that's point number five. Number six. There is promised here in in the new covenant an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. See that in verse 33. I'll put my law in their inward parts and I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Something happens to their heart. Something happens to your heart, doesn't it? You have a new heart. You have a new motivation. You have a new outlook on life because you have been brought alive. By the blood of Christ. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in you so that you can understand this word. Because the Holy Spirit's job, his work, is to reveal the truth of this word to you and to me. So praise God for that. And that's the promise to the Jews that they too will know the indwelling of the Lord. Hallelujah. Under the Mosaic Covenant, Israel couldn't hope to keep the high standards that God demanded. No man could. That's why he took the Lamb of God. He took the Son of God to satisfy the wrath of God over sin and wickedness of man. But in the New Covenant because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the 
the rebirth through Messiah, they will obey out of love. Number seven. Israel will receive the full blessings promised, both physical or material and spiritual. See that in uh, Jeremiah 32, actually, verses 41, 42. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. For thus saith the Lord, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. And you can see a confirmation of that again in one of the scripture references I gave you earlier, Ezekiel 34, verses 25 to 27. Now this wasn't available under the Mosaic Covenant because of the disobedience to the law. They didn't find, they didn't enter into those blessings because they couldn't keep the law. But they will. This is their promise in the new covenant. Provision number eight. I know we're going through this quickly. But this is why I'm giving you these scripture references. And I hope that you'll listen to the the messages again and go through them. Don't just take my word for it. I'm not God. God will show you the truth through his Holy Spirit, by his word. Don't take my word for it, take his word for it. But number eight. A new temple will be built according and under this new covenant. A new temple will be built and this will be the millennial temple. It's not been built yet, but it will be. How do I know that? Because Christ will rule and reign from it. Can you say amen to that? Hallelujah. Praise God. And confirmation of that you can find in Ezekiel 37, verse 26 and 27. New temple will be built. Ezekiel speaks much about the new new temple. Beautiful temple. Beautiful temple. Because it's filled with beautiful people. And more importantly... It's filled with the presence of Almighty God. So much so that we won't need the sun. Because his light will light everything. So there'll be a new temple. And the final provision, number nine, is just as there was law under the Mosaic Covenant, so there is also law in the new covenant. That'll shock some people to hear that. Coming back to law, yes. But it's a different law. In the Mosaic Covenant, there was the law of Moses. Uh, Yeah, the law of Moses. But in the New Covenant, it will be the Messianic law. Turn with me to Romans 8, if you will. Some of you will know these scriptures well. Romans 8, verse 2. We'll start, let's start at verse 1. Romans 8, verse 1. There is now, therefore, how much condemnation? No condemnation. Underline that in your Bible. There is therefore now no condemnation. Who to? To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What was the law of sin and death? The law of Moses. Why is the new law different? Because Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses. 
completely. He is perfection for us. And in him, we have that freedom, that liberty in the Holy Spirit to do what is right. Now we have a choice. And that choice should be for good. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. See, there's a choice. But walk after the Spirit. Galatians 6, verse 2. Galatians 6, verse 2 says this, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. There are four four things, really, I I want to bring out and, and, and point out to you about this law. Because it's important that we understand it. First of all, it's, Many of the original Ten Commandments still stand. We're not to take the name of the Lord in vain, for one. But there are many of the laws that still remain in place. But number two, however, some of them are different. Such as the fact that there is is now no Sabbath law. There is now no Sabbath law. Why? Because Christ is our Sabbath rest. There is no dietary law. Because what did God show to Peter? He let down the the blanket, you remember? In Acts, he let down the blanket with all kinds of unclean animals, unclean under the law of Moses. And he said to Peter, take and eat. Peter said, I can't eat any of those. I've never eaten any of those. They're unclean. It would make me unclean. And God said, let no man call unclean what I have called clean. And we know that symbolically he was talking about the Gentiles to come to Peter. But he was also making a point that in Christ now we have freedom. You have freedom to eat what you want. But we also have a responsibility not to offend. And so some of the laws are different. You can see some of these in uh, the fact that there's no Sabbath law. Romans 14 verse 5. Uh, 2 Colossians 2 verse 16. There is confirmation of the Uh, The dietary regulations there, the change in that, in Mark 7, verse 19, and Romans 14, verse 20. Let's look at Mark 17, just for a moment. Mark 17. I don't want to overload you with too many. Mark 7. Did I say 17? Sorry, Mark 7. Mark 7, verse 19. Mark, chapter 7, I'll start at verse 18, so you get the context. And he said unto them, as Jesus spoke to the people, Are you so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without, or from outside, enters into the man, it cannot defile him? 19. Because it enters not into his heart, but into the belly and goes out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man that defiles man. For from within, out of the heart of men, perceive evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. 
It's the fallen nature that defiles man, not what he eats. That's what Jesus was pointing out to them. And that's what he was bringing out. The truth of this new covenant. The freedom in this new covenant. The liberty. But as Paul said, use not liberty as license. But we won't go into that. Uh, The third point is that Jesus himself, how can I put this? He kind of amplifies some of the old Mosaic laws. For example, turn with me to John 15, verse 12. John 15, verse 12. John 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Well, that sounds pretty plain, pretty simple thing to say, doesn't it? But really, it's, a, it's an application of what was said way back in Leviticus 19, verse 18, about loving your neighbour. We're to love all those in Christ. We're to love It says, my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. It's not doing it because the Bible tells us to do it. It's doing us because we know God's love for us in spite of what we are, what we were. And it's loving other people in that same way. You can also see it in Matthew 5, verses 20 to 48. I'm not going to read all that today but you'll get the idea where Jesus was explaining to them you have you have heard it said that thou shalt not commit adultery but I say unto you if a man thinks about a woman in an adulterous way he has committed adultery in his heart so can you see how this new covenant amplifies some of the things because Jesus was bringing the spirit of the law into play. It's our attitudes of heart, isn't it? Jesus said he would give us a new heart. He said to Israel, I will give you a new heart. I'll write my law on your hearts. In other words, this will be your new nature that you will love because I have loved you. And finally, number four, the messianic law brings with it a new motivation. I've really touched on it already. But according to the Mosaic law, the law of Moses, the motivation was this. Do obey so that you can be blessed. Obey so that you can be blessed. Do so that you can be blessed. Okay? In the new covenant... The motivation is this. You have been and continue to be blessed. So do good. Can you see the difference? It's totally different. Attitude of heart here. It's not obeying a a, a raft of do's and don'ts. It's having a new heart motivation that leads us to do good. Because we love the Lord and we want to please him. That's the, one of the important things to recognise in this new covenant. You have been and continue to be blessed. So do. This is because now this is an unconditional covenant. Isn't it? God knows that we make mistakes. He knows that we trip up occasionally and the enemy will sit on his shoulder and they go, he shouldn't have done that. You're going to whack you with a stick now. You're going to pay for that. But what did we read earlier? There is now no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus who live not according to the flesh but according to the spirit of life. So they are really the provisions of this new covenant. I know they're they're brief, they're concise, but I hope you'll look 
through the scripture references more later on. But I want to look now at the importance of this covenant. The importance. The importance of the covenant is that it it brings to life, so to speak, the, the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, many things were promised in the Abrahamic covenant. That all nations would be blessed through his seed. Are you blessed through his seed today? Are you blessed through his seed today? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Value that blessing. Because it cost Jesus everything to fulfill that Mosaic law. But it brings to life those blessings spoken of in the Abrahamic covenant. And it finally shows that the blessings of the Jewish covenant are now available to us Gentiles through Messiah. Hallelujah. (laughs) The blessings of the Jewish covenants are now open to and available to the Gentiles through Christ. And that brings me really to an important part of this message. And that's the relationship between the church and this covenant. Because we need an understanding of this. It's important. Can't be doing with leaning on that. It's important because this matter's caused so much division in the body of Christ over the years. The relationship between the church and the new covenant. We need to look at it carefully and we need to understand it correctly. Jeremiah states that in this covenant that this covenant, rather, is with Israel. We all saw that, didn't we? It's with Israel, the whole of Israel. Israel, ten tribes, Judah, southern, two tribes. And there are several places in the New Testament where it's also connected with the church. And this is where some problems arise. Turn with me to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Verse 28. Matthew 26, verse 28. Start, verse 27. Sometimes we read these verses when we take communion. Verse 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, the New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Hebrews 7, verse 22. Read from verse 21, Hebrews 7, verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath, by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, sorry. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant or better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. He is a priest. He's a high priest, isn't he? He's a priest of the church. But he's also king of Israel. There are other scriptures I can read, but time is flying quickly. But as a result of 
some of the misinterpretations that have come, there's confusion, even some heresy about the fact that the church has replaced Israel. Or we all know about these things. Replacement theology and all this. It's a cancer that eats at the church. And like every other cancer, needs cutting out because it's false. I want to look at, I want to read out actually uh, uh, two scripture portions. And with God's blessing, we will see and understand the truth of what's being said here. The answer to the questions about this whole thing about has the church replaced Israel and what blessings do we have and we want the good bits and not the bad bits. Israel can have the bad bits and all that. The truth is simple. The truth is simple. Let's read from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11. I'll read through to verse 17. Ephesians 2 verse 11. Wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called on circumcision. Apart from Jews present in this congregation we are all Gentiles considered uncircumcision by those of the circumcision. It says, Wherefore remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was us. That was us. Strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was us before we met the Lord Jesus Christ. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes were afar off have been made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself... Of the two, one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Now I want to read two verses in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Verse 5, Ephesians 3, verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The church has not replaced Israel. The Gentiles have not replaced Israel. We are fellow heirs with them through Christ Jesus. And I hope you see through both of these portions, it's simple, isn't it? It's so clear that we are fellow heirs with them, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. In both of these portions of scripture, you will see that it speaks of Gentiles as being partakers in the covenant, along with Israel. And we can see that we are partakers again, Romans 11 verse 17. Turn me quickly to that. Romans 11 verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, And thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root. 
and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. If we do away with the root, we all die. Israel is the root. If we do away with that root, we all die. Because we as unnatural branches have been grafted into that true olive tree, which is Israel. Can you see that? So then, the relationship of the church to the covenants is the same as it is with regards to the Abrahamic, the land, and the Davidic covenants. And this being that, whereas the physical or the material aspects of the blessing are for Israel, the land, and the line, the spiritual blessings are for the Gentiles also, through the blood of Christ. The covenants are still made with Israel, but we now being added into them as unnatural branches benefit from that sap, the spiritual blessings that arise through them, through Christ Jesus. It's important to remember. We Gentiles, through the blood of Christ, now share in the spiritual aspects of them, including the blessings. This, though, does place an obligation on us as believing Gentiles. Yes, we've been blessed. Yes, we know and we can benefit from the spiritual blessings of these covenants. But there's a responsibility on us as beneficiaries. I'm going to read a scripture to you. Romans 15, verse 27. Romans 15, verse 27 says this. It has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them carnal or material things. Here you'll see that we as saved Gentiles, saved believers, are indebted to the Jews to see their material and spiritual needs met, as did the early believers. Paul took great pains to take collections for the starving Jews of the church in Jerusalem from all around the churches throughout Europe as it was then. Our motivation towards Israel now as believing Gentiles is reflected or should be reflected in the following scripture, Romans eleven fourteen. Almost finished. Romans eleven fourteen says this If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Some versions will have provoked to jealousy the Jews. That's part of our responsibility now as beneficiaries of this new covenant is to make the Jews jealous for their covenant, for their God, for their regeneration that they see in us something that God promised them. And the status of this covenant, well, to the church, the new covenant is the basis really for the dispensation of grace. God is gracious to us, isn't he? God sheds abroad his grace to us each and every day. To the church, this new covenant is the basis for the dispensation of grace through Christ. But to Israel, it's the basis for the dispensation of the messianic kingdom. That's what they await. The messianic kingdom. When Christ will sit on David's throne and rule and reign 
in the new kingdom. Hallelujah. In Jerusalem and from Jerusalem. Not from Rome. Not from London. Not from Droitwich. But from Jerusalem. The only eternal city. And as I stated earlier, this new covenant is an unconditional covenant. So therefore it's still very much in effect. To tie all this up and to finish because time goes so quickly, doesn't it? I just want to read this last portion that I've put. As we've now completed our look at the eight covenants of God, I hope that you've been blessed. And amongst other things, we have seen how God has intervened and interacted in the history of man to bring about a return of the relationship that was lost in the Garden of Eden. That's God's heart, you know. God's heart is to restore that relationship that he had with Adam, where he walked with him and talked with him in the cool of the day. And as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, now as part of this new covenant, that is the place where you are. He walks with you and he'll talk with you in the cool of the day, in the warm of the evening, whenever you choose to listen. The covenants themselves are are very detailed and specific in their provisions, aren't they? But knowledge of them is useful and valuable for our understanding of Scripture. And the study of them will help us to fulfill the call upon us that's laid out for us in this last bit of Scripture I'm going to read to you. You don't have to turn to it, I'll read it to you. It's from 1 Timothy chapter 2 and then chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase more and more unto ungodliness. And 1 Timothy 3, verse 12 to 17. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Not nice to hear, but true nonetheless. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, not from me, but by the Holy Spirit. And from that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. This word will make you wise unto salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And in fact, it says in my version, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I hope these brief studies of the covenants have been a help to you. I hope the scripture references will help you better understand them and to better understand our responsibility of partakers of the new covenant in Christ Jesus and our responsibility to the people from whom our Messiah sprang, the Jews. God bless you and keep you. Amen.